This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hi. There have been rumors going around in the Reddit thread for Facets, my take on reflection in Rust, which happened a bit too early, but here we are, cats out of the bag, let's talk about it. Rumors that I, podcaster slash YouTuber slash faster than Lime, want to kill Sergey, a serialization slash deserialization framework loved by many and which contributed greatly to Rust's success. And I just wanted to address those and say that rumors are absolutely 100% true. I'm coming for you, Sir Day. I'm coming for you when you're least expected. I shall never have another sound night of sleep because until the time comes, you will know I'm coming to kill you. Just kidding, mostly. Except you can't really kill a rust crate. If you prick it, it doth not bleed. And I should know because one crate that I'm actually actively trying to kill is Sin with the Free of Sin movement that I launched a couple of months ago. Wait, what's this now? Well, it's quite simple, really. Consider this benchmark. First off, I have no idea what we're comparing. We'll come back to what exactly we're comparing. And second, those numbers don't look half bad to me. Even the slowest run is still under three seconds. On an M4 Pro, gee, I sure hope so. Otherwise, I just gave Apple a whole lot of money for nothing. Speaking of money, did you know that French derives from Frank, even though the Franks were a Germanic tribe that ended up being a small part of the ethnic blend of modern day France? And did you know that Frank can be traced back to the Proto-Germanic root Franco, meaning spear or javelin? They were fierce warriors, feared by their neighbors, who remained a problem for the Roman Empire up until the time of emperors Aurelian and Probus, who kept having to repel their incursions. Finally, in the 4th century Common Era, Julian defeated them decisively. One could imagine a world where the Franks had prevailed against the might of the Roman Empire, if only they had a platform like Brilliant. They could have learned geometry through thousands of interactive lessons designed by award-winning professionals. They could have learned about derivatives. They could have even learned about parabolas, which I'm sure would have come in handy during sieges. They could have learned whatever their era-appropriate equivalent of computer science would have been. And they could have done so from their phones. Building a learning habit bit by bit every day, sharpening their mind, building problem-solving skills, all in the service of challenging the crushing weight of the Roman Empire. But they didn't. And instead they became a province of Rome and got aqueducts and schools and whatnot. Latin became Old French and the rest is history. But you, you have a chance. Don't let what happened to my ancestors happen to you. Go to brilliant.org slash faster than lime now to get a free 30 day trial of everything Brilliant has to offer. You'll even get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And when the Romans come knocking, you'll be ready. But you can't just slap under three seconds on your readme and call it a day. Or if you do, at least do it with a concurrency of one by passing dash J1 to cargo, like so. Now, I don't know about you, but during those 12 seconds, I've had time for black tea and contemplation. What am I doing with my life? Why am I writing this article? Is this really what I want to spend my 30s doing? Oh, build's done. That dash J1 build is a good proxy for what most people will see in CI, for example, on GitHub Actions free tier. Okay, but with dash J1, anything's going to be slow. But that's not dash J1. This is dash J1. It's so much worse, but it all depends, right? What are we actually building here? What bank do we get for our buck? Facet is not equivalent to Sin, not even a little. It's like we're comparing an apple to a nuclear submarine. And let me tell you, if you prick a nuclear submarine, it certainly does not bleed. Sin lets us parse Rust code. This bit of code can parse itself. This is very exciting if your objective is to write procedural macros in Rust. I mean, you have regular declarative macros, right? This works. It operates on tokens at compile time, not in a preprocessor like it would in C. And you'll notice that we didn't have to worry about what's in the body. The parser has the concept of token trees, like things that are delimited by braces or brackets or parentheses. But we still had to worry about the function keyword, fn, uh, the name, which is an identifier, the arguments, and our macro is currently fairly restrictive. Even just a visibility modifier like pub will break it. Of course, that's a simple fix, but it's a game of whack a mole. You're adding the next bit of Rust syntax over and over. If we were to write a proc macro grade with sin, then we wouldn't have that problem because it parses all the syntax for us, right? We could just parse it into an item fn, and then we get the signature, we get the visibility, we get the uh, the function's name, which is part of the signature, we get the a block, which is the function's body, and also the call side is just so much prettier. You just add an attribute and that's it. But at what cost? Let's find out. Firstly, let's make one thing clear: the expansion of the 
these two macros, the declarative one and the proc macro it's in, are exactly the same. If we want to convince ourselves, we can use the end stable z on pretty equals expanded. Here's the proc macro result. And for comparison, here's the declarative macro result. Piped here through Rust format and BAND, which does almost what Cargo Expand does. The latter is SYN based as well and handles cases that Rust format doesn't, but is, well, one more dependency. The only difference is that we can see the declaration of the declarative macro. So what's the big difference between the two then? Ergonomics. SYN parses the entire thing. If we replace the macro by a macro that just prints the entire body of the function like we did earlier, it's clear as day. We can see an expression that contains a macro, that contains a path, etc., etc. The, the debug implementation of SYN types does not actually output color. Uh, I colorize the output by passing it through GPT-4.1 with this prompt, which is one of my favorite uses of LMs to date. It, it highlighted different string literals with different colors, but I guess, you know, instructions unclear, etc. So in this case, we can see there's a macro invocation. The path of macro is simply the identifier print LN, and there's a bang because that's how you invoke a macro. It's delimited by parentheses. You can also delimit macro invocations with braces. And then we have the literal token stream passed to the macro, which is a string literal hello world with location information that spans. And this is awesome. I want to take some time to emphasize that it is awesome. It is extremely exciting for me, someone who's messed with compilers since I was 17. So for 17 years now, <laughs> But how does it compare in terms of build times, you ask? Let's make some measurements. It's the same methodology we're using hyperfine, which is pretty nice. The gap is so much wider here. Adding dash dash release doesn't do anything because it doesn't affect uh, proc macros. If we want our procedural macros to be optimized, then we can add this to our cargo toml config file. And we'll know immediately if it worked or not because the gap got even wider. And at this point in the video, this is the point where people stop watching and just go comment one of two things. One, that's just proc macros, man. Proc macros are just expensive. That's the way it is. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way. Or two, who cares about cold build? Most of the time you're doing a hot build and then it doesn't matter, right? And I will address both claims that are perfectly reasonable and do not come from straw people at all. I will first address the proc macros thing and then we'll talk about cold versus warm builds. I would like to demonstrate that we don't need heavy dependencies to run a proc macro. It's not as convenient, depending, but it's possible. In fact, you don't really need any dependencies at all. Back before sin, this is what people used to do. And I will admit, I'll be the first to admit, because nobody else is here. It doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily, but it works and it's fast. But like I said, the ergonomics are not quite there. If only there was something in between, something like unzin. Unzin, which means nonsense in German, written slightly differently, is refreshingly simple. First, we import everything in the crates, like it's a prelude, and then uh, we define a keyword because we're going to need fn as a keyword, like we did manually. A keyword is a declarative macro. Here's the expansion of the curious. Then we declare what we want to parse inside the unzin macro. This is our grammar, and we only define what we want to. Let's run through some of the types that we see here, most of which are unzin built-ins. We have many, which is one or more of this, like plus in regular expressions. We have cons, which is this, then, that, two things that follow each other. It's it's a construction like the cons cells in Lisp. Except does a peek. It just looks at the next token and makes sure it does not match whatever we don't want to match. Uh, but it doesn't actually consume the token, so it's, it's still ready for the next thing you match. Uh, just make sure that it's not followed by something. KFN we just define with a keyword macro. It's not a string literal. It doesn't have the double quotes. It's just the bare word FN. Token tree is not just any token, but it it's a whole tree of them. Any parenthesized expression, for example, is a single token tree, no matter how much nesting goes inside of there. As you can see, we're not actually parsing things that we don't need to parse. We're just skipping until we see the fn keyword, then getting an identifier, then skipping until the body, and then getting the body. In the unsyn macro, structs are sequences of things, like cons, but with named field, whereas enums are alternatives. Option T also works. The reason we're defining those as structs with their own name is so we can implement two tokens, a trait from the quote crate, on them. Wait, we're still using quote? We don't have to, but we're still using quote in this example because it and unzin share that proc macro 2 dependency, which is kind of a necessary evil. The proc macro API is not available to non proc macro crates. So if you want to be able to write unit tests, uh, you need some sort of abstraction layer. There's a tracking issue to make the proc macro API available to non proc macro crates with a PR that needs someone to adopt it. 
And that kind of dual proc macro API thing explains the conversions we have to do here in the entry point of our unzen macro. We do token stream from in the beginning, and then at the end, we do a dot into. In this version, there is no error recovery. If you have a syntax error, then it just panics. The parsing is fairly simple, but our requirements are simple enough that, at least for our test function, it works. We're doing a bit of destructuring assignment right after parsing so that we can use the different fields in an invocation of quotes to interpolate them into to the generated token stream, which also keeps the associated span information, so the original location of those tokens in the code, in the input of the macro, which is important. But that interpolation only works for types that implement the two tokens trait from quote, like we said. So we're missing these three implementations, and this is why we gave names to until fn, until body, instead of just using types. Again, this is kind of silly and a result of the current ecosystem. We're just kind of forwarding to the existing implementations of two tokens on some of the unzen types we're using, except for body which is like a brace group and we're just getting rid of the braces and just extending with the children that are inside. Now, you would be foolish not to ask, what do compile times look like? It's doing less work than sin, but it's more practical than dealing manually with the proc macro API. So at what cost? Let's look at cold build times once again. And you know, it's better. It's not as fast as manual. It's undeniably lighter than sin. It's, it's also doing fewer things. It's not as powerful. And that is also kind of the point, because you can do less if you want to. But again, you could argue that nobody cares about cold build times, because, well, everybody's set up caching properly, and everyone uses cargo bin still, and everything they need is already pre-built, and, 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 OK, cool, sure. So let's look at warm build times. To make my point, the body of main now consists of this block code repeated 100 times, which is a literal AI slob. I just asked GPT 4.1 to generate nonsense code, and then I asked it to add more nesting. So so well, thanks, GPT 4.1. And as you can see, my scheme to make sin look bad is a great success. The way this is measured is we touch the main.rs file, which is like changing its last modified time, and then rerun cargo build. Because as I'm writing this, we're in May 2025, and cargo's checksum freshness option is still unstable. So changing the last modified time of the file is enough to trigger a rebuild from cargo. The dependencies themselves are not rebuilt, so we're not paying for building sin again, for example. But we are waiting for sin to parse the entire body of the function from a token stream after the Rust compiler has already tokenized it and built its own abstract syntax tree over that same token stream. So on this benchmark, we can see that 200 milliseconds is roughly the cost of parsing and compiling all that on my machine. And we'll assume that the declarative macro is free. Uh, calling an already built procedural macro seems to be on the order of 10 milliseconds on my machine. And parsing our 11,000 lines of AI slob takes sin about 100 milliseconds. This is the real reason why I don't like sin. I mean, I, I like it. It's fascinating. It's a wonderful tool to write procedural macros. But it doesn't let you do less. It always parses the whole Rust AS the whole abstract syntax tree, even when your needs are much more modest. It's OK that sin itself is large-ish. The, the alternatives that I'm coming up with will eventually, over time, become large themselves and have that fixed cost of compiling them once. But currently, proc macro invocations aren't cached, and it's unclear whether they're ever going to be cached. So any proc macro that parses a lot of code and generates a lot of code does that on every compilation where Cargo thinks something might have changed, even if it didn't. That's why it's important that we get proc macros that do as little work as possible so that compile times, both cold and warm, do not become as big of an issue as they are with Sin and Surday right now. That's just one thing left to do. We haven't actually proven that Sin is to blame for slow builds in larger projects. We've done macro projects, but does it even matter at scale? In the dependency tree for one of my internal tools, Beardist, Sin shows up eight separate times. Getting Sin out of that dependency tree would mean replacing serialization, argument parsing. I'd have to get rid of requests, which depends on Sin through the URL crates, that would be an incredible amount of work. Luckily, there's a trick. We can pretend we made Sin faster to build by first running a build where every crate takes twice as long to build, and then another build where every crate except Sin takes twice as long to build. Between those two builds, there is a virtual speedup happening, a technique I learned about through the causal profiler, cause. We cannot rely on the absolute timings, and it would be pointless to show them, but we now have a magic checkbox on our build graph that says, make this crate build twice as fast. And it lets us foresee what would happen to the build using Cargo's actual scheduler. For example, GIF, which accounts for a good chunk of the build time of my tool, is not actually on the critical path. Making it faster doesn't actually bias anything on a cold build. Similarly, making Tokyo build twice as fast doesn't make a big difference. Things wiggle around, but the total stays the same. Even magically making Surday derive build faster in this specific project has no measurable effect. 
However, if we make sin twice as fast, then the entire graph compacts beautifully. Proc macro dependencies like surday derive and clap derive move to the left along with their dependence, and the overall build time is reduced by a whopping 12%. And you know what's fun is that I wrote this entire video before building this tooling to make those visualizations because I was so sure that it was the case. I've been working on this for, I think, a month and I only found out that I was actually right a day ago. If you're a patron five euros per month or above, you can go in the extras section of my blog and download Fargo, which is the tool I use to make these relative speed up build graphs. It's a wrapper around Cargo and Rust-C that listens for artifact notifications and delays those artificially. Then it converts Cargo's HTML timing files into a JSON payload, ready for consumption by this custom Svel5 component I made for this. Fargo runs fully offline, so you can run it on proprietary code bases and tell your boss C, See, I freaking told you. And if you do, please tell me about it because my email's on my website and I love to hear those stories. So please reach out. That's all for me today. And until next time, take care. Bye. Upset Caucasian men sitting on the bed thinking, who are you? Upset Caucasian men sitting on the bed thinking, who are you? gotta watch, you got a beard, you got the sense that the end is near. Oh, build's done.